pressure for, or the formula for sodium chlorate? What'd you come up with? What's chlorate? ClO3, good. And so what's the charge on it? Minus one. So sodium chlorate is NaClO3, good. Uh, what, which of the following statements is true? An e, e, a scientific law summarizes a series of related observations. How many protons are in arsenic? A. 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 Yeah, good. I made that one a little easier. I could have been a little meaner and, had, and said 18, and maybe some people think AR is arsenic, but I didn't do that. So. Name for TiCO3. It's A, titanium 2. A, you know it's 2 because carbonate's a 2 minus anion. Huh? So that's how you, whenever you have a metal that can have different oxidation states, you have to go by the anion. All right, 13 grams of sodium carbonate. We can, whoops, hang on, let me, I have the numbers here somewhere. No, I guess not. Well, well, we'll set it up. So you've got 13 grams times however many grams per mole, whatever that is, times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules per mole. And that's your answer. All right? I don't know the answer. Okay, uh, so this is probably the longest one, the one that took the most work, uh, number six. And part of the reason, I mean, we took a decent amount of time for that quiz, but when it comes to the exam on Monday, not only will the exam test if you know how to do this stuff, but have you practiced it enough that you can just sort of do it, like knock it off. It's not, it's not, you're not going to have time to sit there and ponder it and work carefully through every problem. It's going to be like, have you done 50 empirical formula problems? So when you see it, you can just do it, that kind of thing. So make sure that you are not just understanding how to do the things, but actually practicing them to the point that you're proficient at it as well. Um, all right, so let's do this. Uh, same way we were doing them in the practice ones in class on uh, Monday. You change everything to grams. So 49.48 grams carbon. 5.19 grams hydrogen, 28.85 grams nitrogen, 16.48 grams oxygen. And then what do you do? You convert it all to moles, right? So convert to moles. I'm going to assume this person's doing it right. I don't know if that's the case, um, but we'll see. So this person got 4.12 moles, which sounds about right. Um, 5.03, yep. 2.06 and 1.03, okay? Then you divide by the smallest one, which is the 1.03, and you end up with, if you divide them all by 1.03, this gives you 4, 5, 2, and 1. That looks right to me, yep. All right, so, yeah. For the amounts, yeah. no, there are no significant figures when it comes to the um, the numbers because they're integrals. You, I mean, right, no, integers. I, I meant like the moles and all the others. At this know. point, no, okay. no, because it's not really an issue of measurement. Right. Um, you should just keep all of the decimals you can because that'll do a better job when you're doing your rounding to make sure you're close to an actual integer. <coughs> I went through this, in, which I did, and got double those numbers, and I did simplify it. 
Yeah. No, because the next part of the question says the molecular weight is 194.19. So you have to now check this. So what we've done so far gives us a formula of C4H5N2O. But that's not necessarily the molecular formula. That's the empirical formula. You have to check this to see if the molecular weight of that formula is 194.19. Is it? No, you have to multiply it by 2, I think, right? So the actual molecular formula must be C8H10N4O2. Now, if the question had asked for the empirical formula, um, then you would have been, if, if we had asked for the empirical formula, you would have had to simplify it at the end by dividing by two. But so it worked out. Yeah. All right, questions about that one? Yeah. I go about that a different way. Mm -hmm. I did. You got the right answer. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. However you like to do it. No, no, no. However you guys want to do it, it's fine. Remember, your final is ultimately going to be multiple choice. So whatever is working is good. Um, all right, and then this one um, from the makeup lab. I know I talked with a few people about this uh, over the weeks as you were working through those problems. The mass spectrum of elemental bromine Br2 is here, and this was actually one of the questions on that lab, right? Why does the molecular ion at over here not exhibit the characteristic peak doubling that we usually see in a mass spectra of bromine-containing molecules, where you have the kind of double peak, is what that's talking about. What did you say? Bromine exists as a diatomic um, molecule. Right. Bromine Br2 actually has two atoms of bromine. So there are four different ways that the isotopes can combine. Um, you can either have bromine 79 and bromine 79, 79 and 81, 81, 79, and 81, 81. So you could have a molecule of bromine that had any of those combinations. That means that you're not going to get doubling, you're actually going to get a tripling where the middle one is twice as high because these two ultimately have the same mass of 160. Yeah. So something to that effect is what I was looking for here, to recognize that there, were, there are still just two different isotopes of bromine, but if there's more than one bromine atom in the molecule, you won't get the peak doubling, you'll get something else. You'll get some tripling or you know, beyond two, it'll get even more complicated. So something, something like that. And then finally, Balanced equation to show the reaction of sulfurous acid with lithium hydroxide to form water and lithium sulfate, <laughs> which of course the balancing is great, but really this is a question about naming. Can you actually write down the right formulas for these things? So uh, sulfurous acid is H2SO3. And we're going to assume that that's probably dissolved in water, probably aqueous. And that's reacting with lithium hydroxide, which is LiOH um, in solution. And that forms water and lithium sulfite. All right. Is it balanced? No. No. How do we balance it? No, hydroxide is minus one. Oh, yes, thank you. There we go. So we got to balance, let's balance lithiums first. This one's a little bit tough, um, well, because of all the different oxygen. So we don't want to do oxygen next, right? Because oxygen is, appears in each molecule. So what do you want to do next? The hydrogen, yeah, we've got, what, five on this side, right? No, four. <laughs> All right. That would make it much harder. <laughs> so we, we do that. And then what about the oxygens? Uh, they all work out, right? Five on each side. So that should do it. All right. Congratulations. You were quizzed and first time in, in this class. I don't know. Some points. The quizzes are an overall percentage of the grade. So I'll probably grade them out of 10. 
No, 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 10 points, and then it's normalized accordingly. So it'll depend on how many quizzes we have. I don't care. It all gets normalized at the end, so it doesn't really matter what I grade it out of. Again, it could be out of 0 .001, but it all gets scaled at the end, so it doesn't really matter. All right, before we uh, get into too much new stuff today, uh, I want to talk, uh, let's review these equations a little bit, make sure that we're doing this just to kind of warm back up. I know the quiz helped with that as well. So today, we're going to do this, and then we're going to get into probably the most important part of this part of the class, which is molar equivalence in stoichiometry and doing these calculations in chemical reactions. This is something that you will continue to do as many classes in chemistry as you take, and it is something that I am always saddened by how badly upper level students remember how to do it. So we will spend some good time on it. We won't get into the next set of notes. We'll just do that for, for the whole day today. So let's start with these. If you've got these, write down these balanced equations, because I, I don't think we did these for last time, right? So give these a try. So the first one, uh, we have carbon dioxide, the gas, and water, liquid. Although, technically, when it's working with the carbon dioxide, it's in the solution of the water within the plant, but it takes it, it, takes it from the air as a gas, so it's not, not really clear. In fact, yeah, this is mostly about the balancing, so let's do that. All right, how, is this balanced? How'd you balance it? like that? All right. Yes. And a lot of these with these word type things, sometimes it can be confusing what's the product and what's the reactant. Um, so you just have to read it carefully and, and look. So here we've got uh, glucose being both oxidized and reduced to form carbon dioxide and methane. So C6H12O6 forms methane and carbon dioxide. Is that balanced? How do we balance that? Two what? Yep, yeah, okay, so there's a couple, uh, right. So you could go 266, but that would be over, no, that's right. And, and that's fine if you come up with those even, if you re realize that everything's some kind of factor. Uh, when you come up with your numbers, just divide everything out to get the smallest integers. Okay, and to produce calcium oxide, which means calcium oxide is going to be over here, calcium carbonate is heated above 500 degrees. Carbon dioxide is also released in this process. That one, that one's balanced as is, right? And then finally, explosive decomposition of dynamite. We have nitroglycerin explodes to produce carbon dioxide, water, nitrogen, and oxygen. All right. So this one might be a little bit tricky because you've got some odd numbers on the left and some even numbers on the right. Um, if that's the case, you can actually balance things in halves or quarters or whatever is needed, or you can try to sort of you could try to like double it right off the bat. It might actually end up needing more than that. We'll see. But let's let's try to do it just like this for now. Um, so I'd pick anything but oxygen to start with. Let's start with carbon. We got three on the left, so we want three on the right. And then uh, let's do nitrogen. We've got three on the left and two on the right. So how do how would you what what coefficient would you put in there so that balances? Yeah. Switch them. What? So, so for if there's two at the left product side, put a two in front of the um, nitroglycerin and switch the three for the nitrogen on the 
Oh, yeah, okay, you could do that. I was thinking more directly we could oh. use half coefficients for now and then double them later. That's another way to do it, is to realize that N2 is two nitrogens, so a half of one is an N. So another way to do this would be to say three halves N2. Three halves times two is three. Right. So you could also, um, as if you heard up here, you could also just double this and then redo it, redo it with this doubled. Okay. Let's do it this way for now. The other way is fine. Whatever you prefer is great. Um, same thing with hydrogen then. So we've got five over here and two over here. So we can balance that with five halves. Right. And then that gives us a total of, let's count up all the oxygens. We've got six here, five halves here, and two here. Um, and that comes out to, what about uh, six, seven, eight, nine, nine and a half, so ten halves, right? Wait. All right, <laughs> maybe that's, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. So if we double everything, we get rid of those halves. So let's do that. I guess we could have done that to start with. We can go two here, six here, five, three, and uh, then let's see. Now we've got 18 oxygens here. That means we need nine here, right? Oh, no, no, because I didn't think about all those other ones. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice if that worked that way. Uh, we've got 12, all right, I'll redo my numbers here. We've got 12 here, five here, and then two. So that's 17, and we need 18, right? So we need a half of an oxygen left. How do we ultimately get this done then? Double, Double everything again. So this becomes 4, this becomes 12, this becomes 10, 6, and there's our one oxygen. And let's check it once again. We've got um, 36 oxygen here, and this is going to be 24 plus 10 plus 2 is 36. So now it's balanced. Okay. All right, now on to the fun part that I talked about earlier. Maybe fun isn't the right word. But it's certainly important. Um, you really can't do chemistry without understanding this. You can't be effective in a lab. Um, if you wanted to do some research or get involved in things like that, you absolutely could without more chemical knowledge, but you really couldn't without doing, being able to do these types of calculations. So we're going to spend just the rest of the day today working on this. We're going to kind of talk about how, and then we're going to do example after example um, and hopefully get a good sense of, of how to do it. All right. So we got empirical formulas. We got molecular formulas. We can balance equations. We know how to go between grams and moles. All right. So the next part is to figure out what in a, re in a chemical reaction is produced and consumed and how much. So at this, for this, we're going to talk about the how much part. And then in a later chapter, we're going to talk about how to actually predict the products. But for a known reaction, we need to be able to know how much do we want to put in, and then how much do we expect to get out based on that. Ideally, we would count the molecules. We would count each molecule that goes in, and we would count each molecule that comes out, and that would give us a perfect idea of what went in and what went out. 
We can't do that because molecules are tiny and there's lots of them and it would be really, really hard, impossibly hard to count. So we use mass as a proxy. In other words, rather than counting the molecules, we measure the mass and then we do a calculation to figure out how that mass relates to the molecules and that's what we call moles. That's what we use moles for. So moles is like molecules. If one of these reacts with one of these, that's the same as saying one mole of this reacts with one mole of that, and that's what a chemical equation shows us. But that's not the same as saying one gram of this reacts with one gram of that, because that's a physical quantity, and those grams might correspond to different numbers of molecules. So to do this, we always use this kind of a um, procedure. You see this little figure here from the book. We have masses that we ultimately want on either side because that's what we can measure. We can measure out grams and then uh, to put in the reaction, and then we can measure out grams after the reaction's done to see what we got out. But we need to get them in moles so that we can use the chemical equation to track which molecules are reacting and how. So the procedure will always be the same. You'll get a question like, if propane reacts with oxygen, we get water and carbon dioxide. What is the mass of oxygen that will react with 96.1 grams of propane. All right. So we're going to do this step by step. You set up the chemical equation, and you have to balance it. And then we do this mass to moles, moles to mass, and we'll get what we want. So let's do it. We'll, we'll start it right here. So the equation is what we've just been working on. Propane, which I'll tell you is C3H8, reacts with oxygen to produce water and carbon dioxide. Now we need to balance it. Why do we need to balance it? Because as written, this means that one molecule of propane reacts with one molecule of oxygen to form one molecule of water and one molecule of carbon dioxide. And that can't be the case because that means that two uh, atoms of carbon would have just disappeared. Right. So we have to balance this. Let's balance the carbon first. We need three of those. And then the hydrogen. We need four of those to make eight total. And that leaves us with uh, 10 oxygen on the right. So we need 5O2 to balance that out. Yeah. All right, now this makes sense because all the atoms are accounted for. So what this means is, in words, one molecule of propane reacts with five molecules of oxygen. Those do their thing, and they produce four molecules of water and three molecules of carbon dioxide. Now we could also substitute the word moles there, because a mole is a number of particles. So we could say a mole of propane reacts with five moles of oxygen to produce four moles of water and three moles of carbon dioxide. But we can't say that with grams. And yet grams is what we have, is what we measured, 96.1 grams. So. I did this calculation for you here. 96 grams of propane times, or divided by 44 grams per mole, gives us 2.18 moles of propane. That's how many moles we started with. The equation tells us to start with one, but we have 2.18. Oops. So here's what we do. We convert the moles of the first substance to the necessary amount of moles for the second substance using the mole ratio. Now that's a fancy way of saying it, but it's kind of common sense. If you look back up here, if this tells us that these, that these molecules are in a 1 to 5 to 4 to 3 ratio, and I know that we have 2.18 moles of propane, 
based on that, right? Yeah. Based on that equation, how many moles of oxygen do we need to react fully? Yeah, ten, uh, five times that, right? Uh, good question. Um, just a minute. So we need five times two point one eight. Uh, equals what? Ten point nine ish, right? So the question was, well, do we need to multiply that by two again because it's O2? Well, let's think about that. What we've just said is that we need five times that amount moles of O2, the molecule. So it would be two times that if of oxygen atoms. But if you imagine doing a reaction and you're, you're weighing something out, right? you're using the substance as the molecule, not as the individual atoms. So in this case, we stick with those numbers, and we don't need to account for the individual atoms in each molecule. It's the overall number of molecules. Right. Now, if I asked you how much water did it produce, how would you have told me that in moles? How many moles of water did the reaction produce? Four times 2.18. Okay. Now, once again, the question was, what is the mass of O2 that will react? If we're setting up this reaction, we can't you know, use our lab instruments to measure moles of O2. We measure grams of O2, mass of O2. So we have to do another calculation to get that. 10.9 moles of oxygen times 36 grams per mole, per one mole, that's going to give us the mass of oxygen that we ultimately need, which I believe is uh, 349. Oh, you know what? I did this wrong. It's not 36, 32. Right, because that O is 16. So yeah. All right. So this means that for this reaction, if we had 96.1 grams of propane, propane, we would need 349 grams of oxygen to do the reaction fully. And that's why this is such an important part of chemistry. This is what you do every time you need to do a chemical reaction. You need to figure out. If I have this many, this much of this, how much of this do I need to actually react with it fully? And this is how you do it. All right, let's do some more. We're going to do um, an experiment in lab that's very set that it involves this question in a couple weeks. Baking soda is often used as an antacid. It neutralizes excess hydrochloric acid secreted by the stomach. Milk of magnesia, which is a suspension of magnesium hydroxide, is also used as an antacid. Which is the more effective antacid per gram, sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, or magnesium hydroxide? So this one doesn't actually give you any quantities. What does it mean for it to be more effective? Right, neutralize more acid. And each acid is a molecule, right? An, a molecule of HCl. So the one that can react with more molecules of HCl per gram is going to be more effective. Let's set up those two equations. We always set up the equation first. So write down, you guys can do this, write down the equation of baking soda with hydrochloric acid and magnesium hydroxide with hydrochloric acid. What will they produce? It says it neutralizes it, but what happens? What does that mean? Water and salt. Yeah, just like the reactions we did in lab on Monday, acid-base reactions tend to produce water and some kind of a salt. So water will be one product, and then all the leftover stuff is the other part of the product. Actually, 
That's not. That's not. A, that's not true for the first one. That's not true for the baking soda. Let's do that one together. That one is a little weird. There's our NaHCO3, and it's going to react with HCl. Actually, we don't. We'll deal with that later. To do this problem, you don't actually need to know the products. Let's set these two up. Um, wait, is that true? No, we need to balance it. Yeah, I guess we need to balance it, right? So those uh, products are going to be NaCl. Water. Actually, not water in this case. It's going to be H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. The reason that that's considered neutralization is that carbonic acid, as you found in lab on Monday, actually goes on to become water and carbon dioxide. It spontaneously decomposes. That's why it bubbles whenever you formed um, carbonic acid. So anyway, is that equation balanced? Yes. It is. All right, let's try the next one. Magnesium hydroxide plus HCl, and that is going to produce water and magnesium chloride, which is MgCl2. Is that one balanced? No. How do we balance it? Two of these, right? And then we need two of these? Okay, that should do it. All right, now let's go back to that question. Which is the more effective antacid per gram? Before we answer that, which is the more effective antacid per mole? Magnesium hydroxide, right? Because one mole of magnesium hydroxide reacts with two moles of hydrochloric acid. One mole of bi baking soda, bicar sodium bicarbonate, only reacts with one mole of hydrochloric acid. But that doesn't make the magnesium hydroxide uh, the more effective and acid yet, because we have to look at what would happen per gram. So let's look at one gram of each. And you guys do these calculations. What this question is really asking is how much HCl in grams does one gram of each antacid neutralize or react with? So see now if you can figure that out, and then we'll do it together. How much HCl in grams is one gram of antacid neutralized? So you need to convert the grams of antacid to moles. Uh, do the mole ratio with HCl, and then convert to grams of HCl. Don't worry, we'll do plenty more examples, but start with this one. So how many moles of HCl does 0.012 moles of sodium bicarbonate neutralize. One, right? The same amount, not one, but the same amount. I multiplied by one. So this neutralizes 0 0.012 times one, which equals 0 0.012 moles HCl. And then the magnesium hydroxide neutralizes 0 0.017 times 2, which is 0. 0, 0.034 moles of HCl. Is 
So do you see that? We, we set the equivalence. In this top reaction, the first reaction, it was one to one. One mole of this, or one molecule of this, reacts with one molecule of this. In the second one, one molecule of this reacts with two molecules of that. So if that's 0.017 moles, that'll react with double, or 0.034 moles, of HCl. And then we can convert those back to grams. Anybody get that? So how many grams of HCl is that? And this one? 1.25. All right, so which one, which is the more effective antacid per gram? The second one. One gram of, the, of magnesium hydroxide neutralizes one and a quarter grams of HCl, but one gram of sodium bicarbonate only neutralizes 0.438 grams of HCl. So we're going to do this in lab in a couple weeks, measure all of these, and actually put cost into it too. So we have not only the most effective per gram, but the most effective per dollar. Um, it's, legit stuff. it's all legit stuff, but yeah, absolutely. It's real stuff. Um, all right, before we get into the limiting reactions, let's do one more example, and then we'll take a little break. So this will be a more, a more typical uh, example. So here's a reaction where three moles or molecules of a molecule called hydrazine reacts to form ammonia, I'll balance this one for you, and nitrogen gas. All right? Now I'm going to give you a couple different quantities here of hydrazine, which is the reactant on the left, and I want you to tell me how much in the same unit each of the molecules on the right form from the reaction. So in other words, if I start with 2.6 moles of hydrogen, how many moles of ammonia do I make and how many moles of nitrogen do I make? And then, next, if I start with 15.2 grams of hydrazine, how many grams of ammonia and how, did, how many uh, grams of nitrogen? Now, I'm going to label those A and B. Those are unrelated, unrelated numbers. Right? So the first one is just looking at the mole ratio. The second one, you have to take the mass into account and the mole ratio. So do you want to try this, or should we go through it together? What? Go through it together? All right, this one together, and then we'll, we'll do some more on your own uh, over the break. So for part A, if we started with three moles of hydrazine, we would form four moles of ammonia. That's what the equation tells us, right? So if we start with 2.6 moles of hydrazine, how do we figure out how much ammonia that we make? Right. We multiply by 4 over 3 because that's the ratio between those two reagents. So think about it this way. 3 times what, we'll say x, equals 4 is really what we're saying. How, what is the factor that you have to multiply by this by to get this? And the answer is 4, four thirds, right? So 2.6 times 4 thirds, anybody want to punch that one out? Three point, just give me, 4 six. All right, so we'll say 4 7. 3.47 moles. 
Now with these, you should always check to see if it's actually reasonable. Right? You know the ratio has to be the same. So it's 3 to 4. So if we start with a little less than 3, we should end up with a little less than 4. And that's right. Okay, so if you got some other number that was not in that same kind of range, it should, um, you should look at it and say, mm, I'm not sure if that's right. I'm going to do that again. All right, what about N2? What do we do to 2.6 to figure out how many moles of N2? Divide by 3, because 3 divided by 3 equals 1. So the same thing. What factor do we multiply by to get that other one? Well, it's 1 third, or divide by 3. So we're going to say 2.6 divided by 3 equals, should be a little less than 1, right? So 0 0.87. That's the mole ratio. All right. So we did that one. I'll let you do part B. Same thing. It's, it's the same question, but you have to convert the grams to moles and then back again. All right. So work on that for about, uh, let's say, five minutes, and then we'll come together and look at those answers and take a little break.
Okay, I want to point out as we go through this a couple of things that I saw some common um, little mistakes. Not big deals, but just things to keep in mind so, so you do this properly. The first thing we need to do is find the moles of the hydrazine, the molecule on the left. And one thing that came up a lot is do I or do I not use this coefficient in front, this 3, to calculate that? Is that part of the molar mass or not? And in fact, it's not. That number just tells us, in the context of this reaction, how many of this molecule reacts with how many of this. The molar mass, or the formula weight, or the molecular weight, or whatever you want to call it, is a fixed thing that is always the same for the same molecule. So the molecular weight of hydrazine will always be, what is it, about 33? Yeah. All the time, no matter what reaction hydrazine is in. So we just use the N2 and the H4 to figure out that molecular weight. And then we say 15.2 grams of hydrazine divided by 33 grams per mole equals what? Like 0.4 something, right? Point what? 0.47. And that's 0.47 moles hydrazine. Okay. Now, this problem becomes just like the previous one. What do you multiply the 0.47 by to figure out the number of moles of ammonia, NH3, that you will produce? Is it 32? I don't know. What? All right, so we'll say 32. Yeah, yeah, because it's 14 times 2 plus 4, roughly. Fine. Um, OK, so what do you multiply the 0.47 by? Yeah, you do 4 over 3 again. Because you need to find it's the same ratio. So if you got 0.47 of this, that will produce 0.47 times 4 over 3, which is what? this many moles of ammonia and then 0.47 times one third which is what? Mm -hmm. 
moles of nitrogen. Okay, so we used the mole ratio once we got moles of hydrazine to figure out how many moles of ammonia and nitrogen we need. Now, notice here, once we got that mole ratio, the four-thirds and the one-third, we don't need those coefficients anymore. The coefficients in the equation were only used to get us the mole ratio. They're not involved in molecular weight calculations. They're not ever involved when grams come in. They're only used to give us those mole ratios. So we know the ratio of how many molecules of this do we need to get this many molecules of this. So then the final step is to convert these to grams. So we're going to multiply by the molecular weight of ammonia, which is 17 grams per one mole, or what does that come out to? About 11 point something. You got an extra one in there? 10.7, oh, OK. And that gives us grams of ammonia. And then we're going to multiply this one by the molecular weight of N2, which is 28 grams per one mole. And that gives us 4.43 grams of N2. So now we can fill this in up here. 10.7 and 4.43. Now a final check. Does that look reasonable? Well, we can't, it's not as obvious here because remember grams and moles don't necessarily correlate. They sort of do here because everything has about the same molecular weight. But you can't look at these three numbers and say that's reasonable. What can you look at though? The total mass on each side because we can't lose any mass in a chemical reaction. So all the masses on the left better add up to all the masses on the right. And, and they do within error, you know, depending on our, how many decimal places we use. But if you got like 100 for one of those numbers, you'd know something was off because somehow you created a bunch of mass that wasn't there to start with. And we know that you can't do that. All right, let's take 15 minutes and we'll come back and talk about limiting reactants and theoretical yield.